Hello, and welcome to another episode of A Toy Store Near You. Today's episode is Imperial Castle, which is owned by John Paul Ragusa. I hope I said that right. Uh, which is in Pauling, New York. Now, I'm from New York City. John is from New York State. Big difference, but I won't get into that now because it would probably really piss off John. But we're not here to talk about New York, are we? We're here to talk about toys. And when it comes to toys, John is not only an expert, he is one of the nicest, kindest store owners I have ever met. Uh, his store is awesome. Save the basement section for last. And I really, really hope you enjoy this episode as much as we did making it. Thank you for tuning in. In a few hours from New York City, you will find Pauling, New York. Pauling is home to the oldest public golf course in the United States, the Dutcher Golf Course. It's also worth mentioning quietly that Pauling is home to the farm from the horror film A Quiet Place. <coughs> but we recommend you go straight to the source of everything that is unique about Pauling and stop at Imperial Castle Toy Shop. Welcome to the Imperial Castle. Owned by John Paul Ragusa and opened in 2017, half the store is a modern toy store and the other half is vintage. And the name, inspired by Star Wars, of course, Star Wars has been an incredible influence in my life. Since I was four and a half years old, I saw it at a drive-in in the Bronx, and I fell in love. And for the rest of my life, Star Wars has always kind of been the one thing that I've always fell in love with. And John's playing with toys all day long, uh, you know. I love you, you know you do. <laughs> so when he tells me that he's tired, I want to, you know, crack him across the head. That's okay, he's still happy. I've been married for nearly 21 years. I am very proud to say that I spend my life with a real hero. My wife is a nurse here in New York and watching what she's been doing over the last 21 years has been amazing. I have two kids. I'm Frankie. I am the uh, youngest one and the tallest in our family, not the flex. <laughs> I'm Madeline, I'm 21. I'm the oldest and the shortest of the family, not the flex. Together, we are the Ragusa children and together we have made this film. <laughs> and then we have three little dogs and that rounds out the Ragusa clan here up in Pauling, New York. So I left my job in the telecommunications company. I spent 18 years as an enterprise level salesperson for one of the four major telcos in the United States. He was in a job that had good benefits, but he was miserable and it wound up catching up with him and an opportunity presented itself and he jumped in. As I've joked around many times, I decided to give up making six figures and concentrate on playing with action figures. We took a big risk opening up a small toy store in a small town against competitors who were all multi-billion dollar juggernauts. When I found out that my dad was gonna open up a toy shop, I was kind of like, yeah, that checks out, and I'm happy that he kind of got out of a sucky job. When I heard my dad was gonna open up a toy store, at first I was surprised, and I was like, huh, so that's really what he wants to do with his life now. My wife and my kids have been nothing but supportive from day one. I think it was a, a big leap of faith, but I know that my husband, uh, he can sell ice in the winter. I remember a f having a conversation with a friend of mine, and he is an incredibly successful dentist. You have no cavities. I also collect vintage toys. And he told me that when he had first opened, there were days where I had nothing to do. And he goes, and I distinctly remember one day, I spent the entire day straightening up the bathroom. You find something to do, the fruits of your labor will be rewarded later on. And I look at this guy now, the people are just clamoring to get their appointments in. I also collect vintage toys. John Paul was able to create such a magical space with that store. It's one of the top toy sellers in the nation. You know, you don't start these things and just instantly become successful. It's a long road and that's a good thing because it helps you appreciate what you have. To give you a little background on the shop itself, we are 
Very unique in the fact that half of our store is actually a functioning, normal, modern toy store. We have everything from LOLs and shimmies to Nerf guns, Hot Wheels cars, Marvel Legends, Funko Pops, Pokemon cards, and everything else you can imagine you'd find in a normal toy store. The other half of the store, of course, is dedicated to vintage, so I like to tell a lot of people that they can handle their children, whether the children is 5 years old or 45 years old. So when it comes to collecting, I think a cornerstone for anybody is having those iconic characters. Coming in at number five is an original carded Darth Vader from Return of the Jedi. You don't know the power of the dark side. So the Return of the Jedi series was the third part or the original end of the trilogy. And this is a Darth Vader still on its original card. Star Wars figures are known for being one of the most counterfeited pieces of pop culture memorabilia. It's a rampant problem. Unfortunately, it's a huge issue when it comes to defrauding people because not only do they fake the cards, they fake the accessories. The accessories, most of the time, have values that exceed the actual action figure itself. Toy companies are producing action figures with retro flair due to the exorbitant prices on the secondary market for vintage toys. This Star Wars figure was put out a few years ago. This figure was not. This figure was put out decades ago. Here's a more recent Yoda, and this is an original Yoda on an Empire Strikes Back card. To have something original, you look for your telltale signs, which is the way that the font is set up, the feel of the card back, the way the bubble is placed. These cards can go for hundreds, and some of them go into the thousands of dollars. A fun fact about my little town here, Pauling, New York, James Earl Jones, the actual voice of Darth Vader, lives about a thousand feet up the very road that I'm standing in front of right now. That is correct. No, he hasn't visited. I hope maybe he'll do. James Earl Jones, if you happen to watch this, come and visit me. We're not that far away. I'll buy you a coffee at McKinney and Doyle's if you want. This is how you know your husband loves you. When he actually has a doll made of you in the store. <laughs> One of the best things about this shop is the legend of my basement. So when we opened, people started hearing that our basement is filled with magical wonders of 80s and 90s toy nostalgia. And it's kind of true. Whenever we get merchandise in, the one thing we can't do is immediately get it to the floor, so it goes downstairs. And when people come in, it's hysterical to watch how sheepishly they'll ask, can, 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 can I see your basement? Can, can I go down the basement? Essentially, if we get in merchandise and we buy out collections, it has to come down here first. This is where we price things, organize it, try to identify things that we're not familiar with. Collectors love nothing more than getting to sift and kind of go through these boxes. And to them, it's like a little bit of a treasure hunt. It gives them the feeling that they're gonna find that one thing that maybe they've been looking for. Right now, without any exaggeration, we probably have close to two to 3,000 pieces down here that are scheduled to come up for sale at some point as soon as we can get it tagged, organized, and kind of figure out what the market value is. It's fun watching the faces of people because whenever someone comes down here, their eyes just light up. Coming up with the name of the Imperial Castle is actually a funny story. My website that I had before this was called the Imperial Gunnery. It still exists. It's a website to help vintage Star Wars collectors authenticate their weapons and accessories. So my intention was to make the store match my website. And it turned out New York State laws about the naming of your business if it sounds like a gunner ammunition shop. So to them, Imperial Gunnery sounded like an armory and I would have to go through this process to kind of unwind all of it and make it work. One night while we were sitting there trying to figure it out, my wife actually said to me, she goes, you know, Star Wars is great. She goes, you're kind of isolating every little girl. And I'm like, all right, well, what would a little girl want? Every little girl wants to live in a castle. So you got both boys and girls involved in it and it brings in the whole Star Wars thing. And it just worked. It sounded like it was meant to be. It inadvertently also makes people think of Castle Grayskull from Masters of the Universe. So it's become a good catch-all name that started off as literally just in a side comment from my wife as she was walking by. 
when you own your own business and you're the brand, your investment and everything is just so incredible that it's succeeding is just a feeling that it's hard to chase in other things. There are days where you just walk out of here with your head held up high because you know, you get to see the fruits of years of labor paying off. When you walk out exhausted because you were ringing that register every 10 minutes, you know you did something right. There's not many franchises that have stood the test of time as long as the Planet of the Apes. It was an amazing franchise back throughout the late 60s into the early 70s, and there probably isn't a human being alive who hasn't screamed out, Take your sticking paws off me, you damn dirty ape! So what you're looking at right now are the 1970s Mego action figures from Planet of the Apes. So the four you're looking at here is Zira, who is one of the female characters, still in her very 1970s style dress. General Urko, this is just a generic ape soldier. And then Dr. Zayas. If you're watching this docu-series, there's no way you don't know the song about uh, Planet of the Apes from The Simpsons. Dr. Zayas, Dr. Zayas, oh, Dr. Zayas. This set would retail for about anywhere from $150 to $200. An interesting point about the shop is that we have no employees. It's really just me. But what's funny is people think that this place has a bunch of employees, and that's really because we have an amazing amount of friends that volunteer and spend time here pretty consistently. Hi, I'm Joe Preshak, and I'm one of the uh, volunteers slash indentured servants here at the Imperial Castle. Come here as much as I can. Sometimes I even spend the whole day here. A lot of people that follow me on social media know that I have a young man named Sean who volunteers here. Hello, I'm Sean. I've been volunteering here at the Imperial Castle since about high school, hoping to become the store's first employee. The toy line that I found to be the most fascinating is probably Masters of the Universe. I like colorful characters with interesting designs. So yeah, He-Man. He-Man. What Sean actually doesn't know is that he will be the store's first employee. Sean's been an incredible asset to us over the last few years. He's a really good kid. He's smart. He knows his stuff. And his ability to learn older toy lines is just amazing. Coming in at number three on our list is probably the single most expensive item I have in the shop right now. This is an original, unused Captain Action Spider-Man outfit from 1967. If you're not familiar with Captain Action, he was a man of many identities. It came out in 1965 by Ideal and ran until 1967. He was a 12-inch scale figure, great mobility in his joints, and you would buy different outfits to equip Captain Action in his adventures. Captain Action, so super powerful you can change him into nine of the mightiest superheroes of all time. Originally, they did nine different outfits, and what they did was a little bit of a departure. Instead of licensing out Peter Parker, Steve Rogers, Bruce Wayne, Clark Kent, you just got the outfit that Captain Action could then put on. Right before the line stopped in 1967, they did the final four releases, and Spider-Man was one of them. As with many rare collectibles, you do get counterfeiters, and you get people who try to restring and put this back into its original condition to fool collectors. I believe this figure may have been at one time passed off as a mint in box or a mint in sealed package. I didn't buy it as that. I bought it as a loose piece in a reproduction box because after I looked at it and analyzed it, I noticed that right in this corner, this looks like it was hand cut by scissors. An interesting note about this particular pack is that because the tape had dried up, we actually found experts who could look at the back of the insert and tell us that the stringing pattern they saw was correct to make sure this wasn't a restrung item. We were delighted to find out that everything was the way it should be, and we're offering this up right now for $11,000. A fun side note is that a mint condition version of this box sold at auction at nearly $23,000. So if that didn't get your spidey sense tingling, it should, because that's a heck of a lot of money for a single superhero collectible. The more expensive an action figure line is, usually the more counterfeit items are put out, like the Spider-Man outfit we were talking about, or the even rarer action boy. When you're researching a toy to make sure it's authentic, look at the wear. A lot of Captain Action pieces and accessories will have melt marks 
they used a plastic that wasn't supposed to last for 50 years. What about 3D imaging and 3D printers? Here's a very delicate Captain Action Action Boy lab set. This is a broken piece. So many people would just go out, try and find a reproduction piece, and just paint this and say that's a go. This is a 3D model. This is an original. It's happening all the time. Check with a reputable dealer, and they'll help educate you on Captain Action, on Star Wars, on whatever vintage action from your line uh, your heart desires. Owning a toy store is a lot of fun because you never know what walks through the door. I know that sounds like I just ripped off the guy from uh, Pawn Stars. It's sort of like hitting the lottery five times in a row. It's true. My door is opened and I've seen things come in here that baffle the mind. And before I owned a toy store, I didn't even think those things were real. I really thought they were all staged and all this stuff never happened. One of the more bizarre things that has like a comical edge to it was Hostess made a carrying case of their products. I believe they were salesman samples that like a hostess salesman would bring out to show stores, like here's our product. I don't know who the collector will be for that, but someone eventually will take this out of the shop. It was so bizarre that I just had to have it. Any good toy shop will tell you that making sure all your products are authentic and real is paramount to having a solid reputation in this hobby. There's a lot of fraud and there's a lot of counterfeiting. Well, I'll give you a great recent story. Um, somebody walked in with Duke. So Duke is uh, from G.I. Joe, and this is the mail-away version of Duke. Now, Duke in the mail-in came with an American flag that you would put on his shoulder. Unfortunately, the one that was given to the person was this little square. Now, most people will go, it looks correct. But to someone who's a little more into the hobby, you would know that this is actually not correct. Now you say to yourself, well, is that a big deal? It's a huge deal. That sticker, if this was correct, would be worth about $150 to $175. Unfortunately, I know that this was cut out of another G.I. Joe vehicle. It was called the Ram. It was their motorcycle. The way you can tell is because the blue doesn't touch the red and white, where on Dukes, the blue and the red and the white all kind of combined because it was a little smaller to fit on his shoulder. Coming in at number two are the Columbia toys made by a company called Gulliver. The great story about these is that most of these exist only in single digit examples. You have, of course, representing Marvel, you have Spider-Man and the Incredible Hulk, and then representing the DC Universe, you have Batman and Superman. The thing that makes these awesome is that their history isn't even that clear. They were made in roughly 1985 or 1986. No carded examples are out there. The only carded example people can find is a white and gray version of the Hulk, which was called the Abominable Snowman. These are incredibly collectible. Each figure you see will sell for between three to $4,000 a piece. And again, it's rare to get four of them in the same room at the same time. I would challenge all you collectors out there to try to do some research. It's incredibly difficult to find anything about them. And of course their rarity is probably the most well-known thing about them. I think one of the things that makes the store as successful as it's been is a reflection of how passionate I am and the fact that I was a collector first. When I come in here every morning, I can absolutely guarantee that I have a smile on my face. There's no other place in the world I'd rather be. And I think that reflects a lot on people's experience in here. It's a great atmosphere here. I always find something that I like, whether it be Transformer or a Funko Pop or even just the company of talking to someone who knows the stuff like I do. <laughs> I've been in here pulling my whole life for the past 30 years, and this is the first toy store we've ever had in, in this community, and it's such a great asset. My daughter and I love shopping here. She absolutely loves everything. He has a great selection. You're walking around and you're just seeing one thing after another that you're like, oh my God, I remember that as a kid. I want people to look at this as an experience. It's not just a transactional store. This is a place to reminisce about your childhood, look at stuff you haven't seen in a long time, and basically walk out of here just feeling like this was a really good part of your day. Number one is the thing that holds closest to my heart, and that's Star Wars. However, I wanted to make sure that I showed you two items that you are not gonna see in very many places on the planet. 
So with that said, we're gonna start off with Boba Fett. Now the Boba Fett you're looking at is a Hungarian bootleg. Now, a couple of countries during the 80s made their own Star Wars figures without the license approval of Kenner. Most notably were Poland, Hungary, and Turkey. Turkey figures are known as the Uzes. Now, Uzes are exceedingly rare. They're probably some of the most valuable bootleg collectibles on the planet. Then you have the Hungarians. The Hungarians are ones that have gained a lot of popularity because you can get your hands on them, and they are pretty cool. The card backs are relatively well done scans of a poster, but what makes them fun is that there's no background. So they just decided to make a nice cardboard front, and that was it. They also didn't take the time to actually glue the bubbles together. They're, they're just simply stapled. This is asking about $6,000. Uh, one at Sotheby's sold a few years ago for as high as $10,000. So these are sought after. It's a really cool bootleg. Generally in the collecting community, a lot of people look at bootlegs as counterfeits and devalue them. In the Star Wars world, bootlegs are exceedingly rare. They're very sought after. And there are a lot of prolific collections out there of these bootlegs items because they're hard to find. Most of them don't ever hit double digits. So Boba Fett, very cool. But if you haven't figured out that I'm Italian by now, I'll just flat out tell you. So as an Italian, the Italian Harberts are the most close to my heart. They actually produced their own card backs for the first movie. And then when the second movie came around, they decided to only produce two figures before they realized they could just import Kenner and slap a label on the back of it showing their company name. So the first one they did was Boba Fett. I've heard rumors of them transacting in the thirty dollars to $50,000 range recently. After they did that, they only made one Empire Strikes Back figure, and that's the Yoda that you're looking at here. This is AFA graded. The art on the back features 32 characters. We're asking $9,700 on this, and this is the kind of piece that if someone walked in and offered me $96.99, I would probably turn it down. It's exceedingly rare, definite single-digit example, and personally, I consider it one of the most beautiful cards that was ever produced in the Star Wars universe. And being Italian, it makes it even that much better for me. It's amazing to see how far along, you know, we've come in four years. It's still kind of shocking to me that this worked. The coolest thing about being a part of a toy store is probably when my friends or like coworkers are like, yeah, I went to the toy store in town. And I'm like, haha, like my dad shop. And it's just a lot of fun meeting people who really know their stuff and can teach you a lot about, you know, toy lines that I wasn't around for. Yeah, you know, we opened up a small toy store in a small town on a kind of wing and a prayer that this would work out. And now that I'm there, uh, so much has changed. He's the happiest he's ever been, and that makes me happy. It's great to know that in four years, I went from an abstract idea to a very healthy and thriving business. You bring your heart with you to wherever you are, and John Paul has certainly done that, just like I do here. I love you. I know. Oh, God. Papa! <laughs>